We are continuing in our series on the book of Revelation called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. This is week 29. I think we're going to wrap it up in two more two more messages and you will have heard the entire book of Revelation and you will be blessed people. You will be. This is the only book out of 66 in the Bible that God promised. I believe you, you'd be blessed reading any and all of them. But this is the only one that he promises you. A blessing that if you will either read it or hear it. And um, so you are going to be and already are blessed for going through the book of Revelation. If you've missed any of them, they're all online. I would encourage you to go back and, and check those out. With today's technology, just about every move you make and just about every word you communicate electronically is being recorded. You, you can't get away with nothing these days. Lord have mercy, I would never run for a political office to save my life. They'd find so much junk about me. Ain't doing it. It's all being recorded and it can be retrieved as a record to be used either for or against you. Isn't that something? Think about that. Uh, social media. By the way, Facebook is 16 years old this month. Started in 2004. Yeah, not just Facebook, but Instagram, Twitter, whatever social media accounts that you've got. All of that is, is recorded and you can, you know, e listen, if you apply for a job these days, if you don't think they're not going to go to your Facebook account and scroll back and see the things that you have said and done, you're mistaken. It's common practice in, in, in employers these days when they're, when they're considering somebody to be hired, they go back and they want to know what, you know, are, is this a positive person? Is this a negative person? Is this an uplifting person or a person that tears others down? What type of person will this be in our company? What will their chemistry be like with the other employees? They go back and they, they take a look at your posts. It's, it's all recorded. Even your, your, your movements you, you can't hardly go anywhere today without your movement being captured by some camera somewhere. They're all over town. They're all over businesses. They're all over residences. Listen, you better not come into our neighborhood and do something you're embarrassed about. <laughs> we all got those rain cameras. We've got one. Our neighbor to the right's got one. Our neighbor to the left's got one. Our neighbor across the street has got one. You can't get away with nothing. I can't even get away with slipping out to buy my wife a birthday present without hearing a voice come from a camera saying, where are you going? <laughs> like, Lord have mercy. Because we have these apps on our phones. Evie gets a ding. There's motion out in front of her house. She looks and it's her husband getting in the car and you can talk over it. You can hear what's going on and you can talk over it. And she says, and, and where are you going? I'm like, Lord have mercy. I can't, I can't even go in and out of my house without people knowing about it. This, this is all being recorded. And actually, you know, it's scary to think of. It's good in another way. I mean... They're catching people left and right because, no, I wasn't, I didn't come up in your yard. Oh, yes, you did, and we have video right here. We've already sent it to the police department. But it's all being recorded, whether you like it or not. In Matthew 12, 36, it records Jesus saying, I say to you that for every idle word, and by that he didn't just mean the silly words that you say, he means all of your words, even down to the idle words, I say to you that every idle word man may speak, they will give an account of in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So I don't know about you, but years ago, probably 20 years ago, I thought of that scripture and I thought, this, it's impossible. 
It's impossible that every word I speak is being recorded. Every movement, every act that I, that I do, all of my behavior is being recorded. That's impossible. But today, it's becoming more realistic, isn't it? It is not far-fetched at all to believe that every word, you, every word that I speak right now is being recorded. <laughs> every word you speak, every motion you make, everything you do, your behavior every day is being recorded. It's very realistic. So I want to ask you this question. Just how, uh, how big of an impact do your words and actions here in this life have on your eternal life in heaven? There is a slide that asks you that question. We'll figure it out here in a minute. There we go. Let me ask again. Now we're, I'm hitting it, he's hitting it, I'm hitting it, he's hitting it. You, you, you go, Greg. No? Well, let's not be distracted by that. Let me just ask you the question again. Just how big of an impact do your words and actions here in this life have on your eternal life in heaven? It just might be more than you think. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for all of the benefits and blessings that we woke up to this morning just because we're children in your house and citizens in your kingdom. A kingdom where we will live forever and ever. And as we consider this incredible word in the book of Revelation that you've given us today, I pray that you would teach far above my ability to teach and give us all ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would like to teach us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, we've already studied the millennial reign of Jesus here on earth and discovered that Satan is bound for those 1,000 years. Now, there will be saints with glorified bodies and saints with earthly physical bodies that will produce children and some of those will stray from Christ. And if you missed that message and are thinking, what? What? In my mind, when we go to heaven, there ain't no marrying, no children. Well, that, that, that's a part of eternity, but it begins with the millennial reign of Christ. And there are actually children born. There's actually those that stray. And if you, if you still can't comprehend that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. It explains all of that, and it is an eye-opener for sure. Uh, there are a lot of people, I, I bet if we could, you know, round up a hundred Christians and quiz them about this, they, they wouldn't have any, any knowledge of that. But it's very real, so go back and review that message if you didn't get it. So now after that thousand years is finished, let's look what happens. Again, this is Revelation chapter 20, and we're in verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Okay, just a couple thoughts about that few verses, Gog and Magog, uh, back in the day, if you were reading this in John's time, that would have been uh, more obvious to you, the landmarks that he was talking about. But um, suffice it to say, it's just an expression meaning from one end of the land to the other. And it says, whose number is as the sand of the sea, and that means that there will be a lot of people who were deceived by Satan again and have fallen away. And, and, I, and I know that some are thinking, Paul, this is not the way I thought things would be. I thought when I died, I went up to heaven, and I float around on a cloud, and I'm playing a harp uh, for eternity, or maybe I get to uh, go see Jesus, and then I get to play golf for eternity. That's heaven to me. So what's all this about living on earth again and working? 
and some people dying and having kids and sinning. I thought there wouldn't be any of that in heaven. Well, welcome to your wake-up call. I'm not making this up. It's, it's in the scriptures. But because this book is so rarely studied and so rarely taught, many Christians are not even aware of this stuff. They're just not. Some pastors won't even teach the book of Revelation. And that baffles me. It's, it's the one book that he could teach that his book would be guaranteed a blessing uh, for hearing. And, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge for sure because there's so many signs and images that, and, and terminologies that we don't use today that have to be explained. And that's what we've taken. I mean, what, are we, what did I say? This is week 29 out of 22 books. By the time we're done, it'll be 30, 31 weeks out of a year. That's, that's, you know, that's over a half a year invested in one book. But it's well worth it. And I'll tell you what, in every single message, I have learned things that I never saw before, even though I've taught the book before. And there is something in every passage of the book of Revelation that applies to today. It's not just a futuristic, futuristic uh, book about, you know, something that's going to happen after we die or after we go to heaven. It has principles that are applicable to today. And you can see why I've been so emphatic. Um, it's important that we rule well in our lives on this earth now. That was the last question I asked last week, if you remember. I think I started with that question and I ended with that question. How are you ruling your life now? Well, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And so I have been emphatic not only in preaching that to you on Sundays, I've been emphatic in thinking about that myself throughout the week as I study these passages. This is a very, very real thing. And you think you're 70 to 100 years in this life is long? Start thinking about turning a thousand. A thousand years old. We are eternal beings. I know every Christian knows that. But I wanted to slow down and really think about it. We are eternal beings. And those of us with glorified bodies, even in the millennium, will, will, will live the entire time. I mean, you will be sending people birthday cards saying, you know, happy 800th birthday. You don't look a day over 700. You, you, you're looking good for 900, honey. That sounds funny, doesn't it? But if I'm reading my Bible right, it's very real. We are eternal beings. This is a very real part of our future. And during the thousand years, Satan is restrained, but after that, he is unleashed. So one might ask, why do people re rebel against Jesus in this, in this perfect, um, you know, euphoric, millennial reign where Jesus is the king and Satan is bound and that means there's no deception, no influence of the evil one roaming the earth like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour like he is now. That He's restrained, he's out of the picture and people are still falling away from the things of Christ. How in the world could that happen? Well, let me answer that question with a question. If things were so great in the Garden of Eden, why did Adam and Eve rebel? Think about that. Think about that. You see, I, I'm, I always got to be careful because I start preaching my last week's message again because I think of the points. But I was saying that we Christians, we blame everybody. We blame everything. Well, it wasn't, wasn't my fault. It was, it was her fault. I only did what I did wrong because of what she did wrong to me first. Or my environment. Or I'm a victim of my circumstances. Or I just can't catch a break. We're always blaming somebody else or the enemy on our bad behavior. And in this case, in this millennial reign of Christ, that, you, that won't be an excuse. It just won't be an excuse. And people will still fall away during this millennial reign outward conformity to Jesus 
will be required. Remember, we, we learned that Jesus during this time will rule with a rod of what? Iron. He, it's going to be this, his word. But, you know, we live in a time of grace. And, you know, sometimes I'm thankful for that. And sometimes I wonder if it's a good thing or not. Because we could get away with junk for a long time right now. And we live in this time of grace where he allows it. But during that millennial reign, if I understand it right, the, the, you know, every, anything and everything that's outside of God's will is going to be dealt with quickly. Quickly. We will be required to obey. But inward conformity will be a matter of personal choice, just as it's always been. Any parent can understand this. Johnny, sit down. No. Johnny, sit down. No. Johnny, sit down or I'm going to give you a spanking. So Johnny sits down. And Johnny says, I might be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still standing up. Outward conformity, but not inward conformity. You know what it's like to watch your children conform on the outside and time will tell if they truly conform on the inside or not. So there will be people that fall away during this time. When Satan is released, he will gather up an army of rebels. Look at verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice once again there is no battle. Just like this battle of Armageddon. How long did that last? About a minute? <laughs> You know, I said it, and I'll say it, and I'll keep saying it. There is no competition between God and Satan. None. None of this, you know, um, there's a video years ago where they get in the ring, you know, with each other, and they, they box, and, and for a while it looks like, you know, Satan's got Jesus down, and, but, you know, they do the ten count, and on about the second to the last count, Jesus comes up and knocks Satan out victorious, you know. That, that's, that's kind of a neat video in some ways, but it is totally, totally unbiblical. Totally unbiblical. There is no battle between God and Satan. There is no battle between Jesus and Satan. Greater is he that is in me, that's the Spirit of God, than he that is in the world. There's no competition, and there's no competition here. Just, just in an instant, God consumes them and he throws Satan into the lake of fire. And Satan is thrown into that same lake that the beast and the false prophet was already cast into. If you remember that at the beginning of the thousand years. And notice it said are where the beast and the prophet are. Not were. Uh, they were and they are. <laughs> because once thrown there it says that they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I know that's hard for us to comprehend in our human minds. It's hard for us to comprehend forever and ever. And it's hard for us to comprehend what that torment must be like. And it's hard for us to comprehend that being done. When someone commits a heinous murder, let's say, you see it on the news, there was a terrible murder. And let's say that you hear that they, uh, they, they were found guilty and they go before the judge for their sentencing and their uh, sentence is to spend five years in prison. Does that bother you? Hmm. You bet it does. There's stories like that in the news right now. I, I shout at my television set sometimes. What is wrong with you people? You've got to be kidding me. You see, you're a lot like God. Which makes sense because it says in his word that we're created in his image, right? And people that say, oh, I, can't, I would not serve a God that would throw somebody into, hey, you'd, you'd, you'd do it ten times faster. <laughs> and you're a good person because it's just, it's, it's right, it's recompense. 
It's not, it's, it's not just, or you could say it's not justice. So then is God sadistic? Not in the least. God is just. And just like you don't want that um, heinous murderer to only do five years in prison for his crime, you, you want justice. God is the same way. And this is justice for those that have rebelled against him and refused him. And I, I, don't, I can't you know, get back into all the past messages that we've gone through, but remember there was a time of great grace. I, you know, I can't believe all of the chances throughout Revelation that God gives people to accept him. If you remember, at, at one stage, he took a, a third of the people and left two-thirds. And then it got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. This, this is the culmination of a lot of rebellion. This is not just God being some mean old person that's upset with somebody and going to cast them into the lake of fire and make them burn forever. This is justice. This is justice. So you see... This is really the beauty of God offering us the perfect sacrifice for our sin. When you think about this, when you read this, you need to remind yourself, I don't ever have to experience that. And, you know, same to the people that say, I can't, you know, I wouldn't serve a God that would do such. Well, it would be, it would be true. That would be true if he never gave us a chance, if he never gave us an option. But he gave us an option to avoid that. And it is so easy. All it takes is a profession of love for him to say that I will accept your salvation. All we have to do is accept it. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, I'm going to tell you uh, straight up that this passage is a passage of uh, somewhat disagreement, controversy, not really controversy, but different opinions about what different Bible scholars believe each part of this mean. But first of all, I want to point out that whether you understood it or didn't understood it as we read it, that there are no blood-bought Christians standing in judgment here. There are none. This, these are the dead standing before God. These are the unbelievers standing before God for judgment. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life. See there, there is that incredible recording. How big is that book? <laughs> it talked about other books and then this book, you know, I think the book of life is just a record of names. Maybe those other books are all not really physical books like this, but maybe there's some electronic system like, you know, all of the... Facebook posts gathered, all of your Twitter posts gathered, a recording of every word that you've ever spoken gathered, all of your video as you walked, you know, through town and the neighborhoods gathered, collected a record of your entire life. I'm, I'm telling you that that is, it really has been an eye opener to me. I think even probably, you know, 20 years ago, we would have, we could not have fathomed everything that we say and do being recorded. But it's very realistic now. Very realistic. And that is these books that this passage is talking about and the book of life. So that's it. The world and actually the universe, all of heaven, all of earth, all of hell are cleansed of evil and sin. You know, we've studied so much in the book of Revelation that was, you know, is actually kind of difficult 
to talk about publicly. There's a lot of gruesome stuff happening. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering. It's been difficult for me at times to think, how do I present this in a way that I'm teaching God's Word just like it was meant to be taught as best I can, but yet it's, it's pretty graphic too. And I think through a season of that, through the tribulation, you know, all of us were wondering, when is this going to end? When is this going to come to the end? To the end of all of this, pain and suffering, well, this is it. This is it. All of the earth, all of heaven, all of hell is all cleansed of sin. Now, that heaven that you've always thought about begins. You check your harp out, you pick a cloud, and you start playing. If that's your image of heaven, I don't think it's accurate, but I don't know. Or you go around and you meet Jesus and King David and the Apostle Paul and then you start visiting all of your loved ones that have been gone. You know, in years past, now that I, I do believe that's part of it. I do believe that. I think it's going to be absolutely incredible. And you're going to walk around in euphoria for eternity. And, and by the way, we are going to study the New Jerusalem next week. That's going to be a fun message. <laughs> that one's going to be a fun one to go through. And it is absolutely awesome. But there are a few more details that you should be aware of. Those unbelieving sinners have been judged the judgment of condemnation. Their judgment was unto death. Their Lives were judged by their sin and their lack of accepting Christ. And their judgment was a judgment of condemnation. But what about you? The blood-bought Christian. Are we all going to be on equal terms? Turn over to 2 Corinthians 5.10 for a minute. 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10 There are some Christians that think that they can live however they want. We know the scriptures. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Is it true? Yes. But some people take that and convert it into what we've often called greasy grace, you know. I can still do whatever I want and no big deal if I slip and sin here and sin there. Which really, anybody that does that, by the way, doesn't understand the concept of sin. They don't understand. Who in the world would say, well, I just, you know, I, I know I can still be a Christian, but I'm going to do this activity or this behavior or say or do this thing that is actually harmful to me. They are still being deceived that it's something good for them. I said it, I think, last week. If you saw... The sin that you're being tempted to commit, if you saw it undressed from its deception, you would be appalled by it. You would look at it and say, absolutely, in my life, absolutely not. Oh, it was looking good a minute ago, but now that I see it for what it is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But there are some people, some Christians that feel like they can still... You know, and, and it really bothers me when somebody wants to have an argument about... It, it, it's okay for a Christian to do this. I'm like, why, why in the world would you be arguing, <laughs> you know, if it has any semblance of something that would be harmful to you? Get away from it. Get away from it. But there are some Christians that think that they can still do whatever they want, say whatever they want to say. They say, I can basically skate by in this life as long as I'm saved and I'll go to heaven and have a wonderful life. They might quote the, the uh, passage about the thief on the cross. Well, he was a thief up to the, just before he drew his last breath. And he looks over at Jesus and calls on the name of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Yes, you, today you will be with me in paradise. I, I remember I'll be transparent and tell you that there was days that I was doing things in my life that I shouldn't do. And I remember always thinking, Lord, just please, when it comes my time, let me know just a few minutes advance so I can plead the blood of Jesus and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior one more time just to make sure I slip off into heaven. Now, 
you're laughing, you're shaking your head, you're smiling, but I bet everybody in here has had some version of that thought before. It's as long as I can get to heaven. As long as I can get to, what you judging me? Well, I've I've accepted Christ as my Savior. We're all going to heaven. Well, you might want to think again. Yes, you are saved and you're going to heaven, but what will eternity in heaven be like for you? Think about it for a minute. I have forced this on myself and I've been forcing it on you week after week to give eternity a lot of thought. I've said it time and time again. Life on earth is like this. <laughs> life in heaven for eternity is I can't even stretch my arms wide enough. And, 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 and we give this all kinds of thought and planning and, you know, emotion to this. And to this we think, ah, manana, manana. I'm going to heaven. What will you be doing? I don't know. Does your life, what you're living right now, affect that one? No, I don't think so. As long as, you know, all my junk's under the blood, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'll be in heaven. Everything will be fine. Well, you, and I'm not arguing that point. Please hear me. I'm not arguing that point whether you're saved and going to heaven. I'm not arguing that. I'm talking about what will eternity for you be like. The view... That you hold about the afterlife will affect your thinking and behavior in your current life. That, that's probably the, the crux of this message right there. I want to say it again. The view that you hold about the afterlife will affect your thinking and behavior in your current life. Even to the point where the person, the Christian, that gives no thought to the afterlife, that doesn't mean that it's not affecting their life now. Oh, yes it is. It's not, they're, not, they're not being more careful about what they're doing because they don't think it matters. They don't think it matters at all. There are some details about heaven that are not recorded in the book of Revelation but are still very important details that we should know. All right, I've had you turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10. Let's read it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one of you may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now why is that important? Back up to verse 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. The Apostle Paul is telling the churches in, Cor in Corinth that it matters how you live now. Your, your eternity is greatly impacted by how you live now. And so the next question is this. If salvation is by grace apart from works, then how can believers be rewarded in heaven for our works? The New Testament definitely states that, that we will be rewarded for our good works. Jesus confirmed this in Matthew 12.36. I put it on the screen for you. He said, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Every word. This is Jesus. And he took it even, even further in his Sermon on the Mount. You'd have to turn there. But he, he said, do not store up for yourselves, as a familiar passage, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's Matthew 6, 19. So the saying, you can't take it with you, is not exactly true for Christians. Now when it comes to material stuff, I would, I would agree. What's the old saying? I ain't never seen a U-Haul a behind a hearse, you know, or a trailer behind a hearse. You can't take that stuff with you. But apparently, there are some things that the Christian takes into eternity with us. You might say, but Paul, I thought we weren't saved by works. You're not. Romans 9, 10 makes it very clear. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? You will be saved. 
Period. Are you going to heaven if that is you? Yes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm giving this a lot of thought. And I especially am giving it a lot of thought because I know that my occupation will be over when I die. There ain't going to be no preaching in heaven. It says that preaching, teaching, you know, will cease. We will have the teacher. <laughs> the most incredible preacher. I'll be out of a job. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm, I, I think, well, maybe he will have me do this. Or maybe he'll have me do that. It's, it's hard to imagine because you don't know all of the details. But listen, we, I really think it's very important that we give this a lot of thought. It will impact our lives now. So there's nothing about works and what is required for salvation. But what you're doing now here in this life does have eternal consequences. There are some opportunities for pleasing God that we will only have, as the Apostle Paul says, while in this body. Dr. Miles Monroe called it his earth suit. It, it, the men that went to the moon, they had to have a space suit. They had to have a suit that was, uh, you know, s suitable for being on the moon. We have this earth suit that, that, that works for us to be here on the earth. But Christians, when we're either raised in the rapture or when we die and we go into heaven, we will have glorified bodies, bodies that are suitable for heaven. And I know some people still even wrestle with the thought that there really is an afterlife. That there really is a God. That there really is some... When I die, I don't just, you know, put me in the ground or wherever you put me and, and that's the end of it. Lights out, it's all over. There, there, there is life after death. There is life for eternity. Your spirit lives on. I'll tell you what, I have, I have seen bits and pieces of this in um, walking along people, alongside people that had um, terminal illnesses or maybe, you know, somebody that has um, something, you know, a, a disease or something in one of their limbs and let's say that they, that they lose a leg. And this, this part of their body is gone. Do they... Act, are, is their personality altered? Are they a different person? Do they go by a different name? Do you, you know, interact with them differently because a portion of their physical body is gone? No. They're, they're still them. They're still that person. Their spirit hasn't been changed a bit. I mean, you can, you know, you can run that example all the way down to where the entire body is gone, is dead. It, it's, if you've ever been with someone... And I know it's a sad thing. I don't mean to bring up, you know, sadness to anybody. But if you've ever been with anybody that was dying, you were there for their death. It's actually, it's a sad thing, but it's actually a precious thing. Even God's Word says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of His saints. It's very precious. Michelle Childress. I wanted so bad to be there at that last moment. I, it's a long story. I parked at the wrong garage where we always parked to go see her. I didn't know they moved her to the other end of the hospital. By, I got, by the time I got there, she was gone, but Evie was with her. And she said, up to 30 seconds, 30 seconds before she laid back and slipped into heaven, she was Michelle, talking, interacting, at times even uh, humorous. And then in an instant, this, this physical body, her case was this uh, horrific cancer that she had that she battled for so many years. She was a champion. But her body finally succumbed to it and, and her physical body was gone. Don't tell me that she is not still alive. It is a fascinating thing to see. And we will slip into heaven. We will have life after death. And listen... It is possible to have a saved soul and a wasted life. I don't want to mess with, step on nobody's toes, anybody's theological thinking, but I would say this is true even for Christians. 
You, you can battle the semantics of that. If you're saved, it's, you know, you're not a wasted life. You're a soul saved for the kingdom. I'm, I don't even think I'm on that page, and I think you know what I'm saying. It is possible to have a saved soul, but a wasted life. And that life will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. But Paul, I didn't think we were in that crowd being judged. Now this is where some Bible scholars differ. But my understanding is we're talking about two separate things here. The great white throne judgment is the unbelievers. That the ultimate judgment is a condemnation. It's eternal torment in the lake of fire. It says that even hell goes there. That's another you know, message about what that means. You, people think of hell that the lake of fire is hell. That's not, that's not the Bible refers to it as Hades and several other names. But uh, even hell, all of the souls in hell are sent to the lake of fire. That's, that's not the judgment that we're talking about. It does seem apparent that there is the judgment seat of Christ that's not judging your soul as far as whether you go to heaven or the lake of fire. This is, this is a different kind of judgment. If you've ever been to a competition where people sang and then the, you know, the judges judged them and the winner was in second place and third place, this is that kind of judgment. This is more a judgment of rewards based on what you did in your life and it actually should be an encouragement in our service to the Lord today you think you think the good things when you help somebody you take care of them and nobody knows about it you, you don't think God knows God knows there's actually scripture that says it's more important that Jesus knows about it than anybody on this earth knowing about it. Won't even go so far to say if you're applauded for it here on earth, you just got your reward. I'd rather do mine in secret and have them rewarded on this day. It should be an encouragement in our service to the Lord. It should remind us of the principle in Hebrews 6.10 that says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So that writer knew that the troubles of this life were worth it because he knows he will be rewarded for it at the judgment seat of Christ. This is a very real part of your future. If I could, if I could correlate this to some example of um, some reward or something that you are going to receive in this life, you'd probably get it better because you can comprehend that. You, you're going to be employee of the year, teacher of the year. You, you know, Fox News or whoever is going to make you neighbor of the year. Well, I better, I better be careful how I talk to my neighbors if I'm going up for neighbor of the year. Don't want to spoil my big reward. We'd give thought to that because we can comprehend that. Well, whether you can comprehend all the details of this or not doesn't make any difference. It's part of your future. So what is more important to you? Pleasing man that lasts 70 to 100 years? Or pleasing Christ which lasts for eternity? Now think about that. How much thought, how important it is to you to please other people. I'll confess, I like people to like me. I want people to like me. I get worried if I think I've said something or done something and somebody doesn't like me now. I want to go back and say, you know, I didn't really mean it that way. I want to make sure you understood because I want people to like me. We put a lot of thought into that. But how much thought do we put into our, 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 our words and our actions here on earth pleasing Christ for eternity? For eternity. This should be an encouragement to us actually. But we're so busy working, socializing, running here and there. And some by gossiping, running other, persons down, other people down, being negative. And we don't think that matters. We don't think that matters because it's all under the blood. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I know that. I'm not going to lose my salvation. I'm going to heaven. 
I think we all got that part down. But I feel very certain that a lot of Christians don't have this other part down. What is that going to look like in eternity and how is eternity impacted by what I'm saying and doing today? Are you doing things that have eternal value? Are you saying and doing things that bring people to the knowledge of Christ? Do people around you even know that you're a Christian? Well, I don't want to offend and I don't want to ruffle any feathers and you know, you got to be careful what you say today. Yeah, we're pleasing men. Pleasing men. Don't want to get in trouble with people down here. Down here. <laughs> Where if we stood up for the cause of Christ and spoke out and said something that drew their attention to righteousness or God or Christ, that that, that statement here would have eternal impact. In heaven. Eternal impact. Are you using your words to build up or to tear down? What's it going to be like on that day when you appear before Christ? I hope you give a lot of thought to that question this week. What is that going to be like on that day? What type of reward will you receive? What position of honor? Will Jesus entrust to you? Is he going to look at your life and say, Okay, yes, you're saved. Yes, you made it to heaven. Yes, you're here for eternity. You can get your heart, pick out your cloud. <laughs> yes, you made it. But I can't trust you with nothing. I can't, based on your years of life, I can't, I can't put you, I don't know, over what, a city, a, a region, a, a project, a job, whatever. Everybody thinks, you know, heaven's going to be like the ultimate retirement. I actually don't think so. It, 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 there's scripture that says that we will minister to the king. We will minister to God. What, what does that look like? I don't know. But it's not just floating around on a cloud playing a harp. It's not just doing nothing because we're gone to heaven. There are things that we will do for eternity. And what is he going to put over uh, you over? What is he going to entrust to you? We're going to be serving the king. And it will be greatly based on the life you're living here and now. Would you stand? I know you're saved. But when it comes to your words. When it comes to your works what are you taking to heaven for eternity let me just ask that again when it comes to your words when it comes to your works when you die or if the rapture of the Lord happens, when you slip off into heaven, what are you taking with you? What is eternity going to be like for you? How are you having impact on that in your life now? Oh, Father, help us. Wow, the best I could do, I don't even think I, I, I barely scratched the surface on the reality of your of your scriptures today, Lord. I did my best. None of us knows what it's going to be like. First of all, I just thank you for the honor of spending eternity with you. We've got all the songs, no more dying there, we're going to see the king, no more tears, no more sadness. We know all that. But it seems very apparent, very evident in your word that our lives now will impact in some way eternity in heaven. And Father, I pray that every one of us, myself included, would give this some serious thought. When we think about our words and our actions today, <clears throat> to, to not just think, well, okay, so what I slipped, so what I said something ugly. To think that, you know what? 
me saying that could, could have an impact on, on my life for eternity. And uh, I think there's something very special, very special about choosing the right thing, choosing what is in your will, in your teaching, in your laws, in your principles, while we're here, as the Apostle Paul said, in the body. And I pray that we would all consider that. What a wonderful opportunity this 70 to 100 years on this place as earth as we know it now to choose you, to please you, to do what is right, to honor you, to live for you. So I thank you for this life. Thank you for the opportunity to express my love for you, all of our love for you, and show you how much we love you. Father, those that don't even know you, I pray that this message would pull at their heart and compel them to turn their life over to you and choose today as the day of salvation so that they too will spend eternity with you. And Father, as we open up our altars at the end of the service, I pray that anyone that needs prayer would be obedient to your word to come and the elders of the church, those that are uh, spiritual, you know, know the things of the Lord, pray a prayer of faith over them, anoint them with oil. And even as we transition now over into our time of fellowship, I pray that you would bless the food. We thank you for it. We know that you provided it. We ask you to bless it. But even more than the food, I pray that you would bless the fellowship. That this group, this family called Christ Family Church would continue to grow in love and care for each other. And we thank you for this life. And we thank you for the privilege, the honor of spending eternity with you. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, you come on down. We'll stay and pray as long as you need prayer. Otherwise, pray that it's a blessed day for the rest of you.